part of what makes retirement accounts so personal is that everyone's situation is different. Your income, expenses. your future expenses, your health condition, the size of your family. And, and, I, and I say that because I, I think there are so many of us who are so like sharply convicted about the way that they believe money should flow and be structured. And like, just because one person in your life isn't investing in their 401k, or you may have a friend who has a 529, but you don't like none of these, this is not about right or wrong. Right. This is not about, Hey, these are all of the things that you can take advantage of. And therefore you should, some of these things just may not make sense for you. Welcome to the Vision Regular Podcast presented by Success, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Julian. And I'm Kirsten. And today we are continuing our Financial Literacy Month deep dives by talking about retirement accounts and planning. Let's do it. But before we dive in, I want to give a shout out to Heidi Pie, who listened to this podcast for the very first time a couple of weeks ago. And it just so happened to be the tipping episode, which, by the way, is the episode that has sparked so much conversation since it posted. Yeah. Anyway, Heidi Pye left us a five-star review and called the podcast Top Notch. Okay. She says we were so insightful and hella relatable, and it was an instant subscribe for her. So, Heidi Pye. Thank you. We hope this episode is as insightful and relatable as the rest of them. I I don't know if you said Heidi Fi just now. <laughs> Heidi, or Heidi Pie. Pie. Heidi Pie. Okay. Like pie that you eat. Or Sorry, pie. Heidi. 3.14 something, 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 something. I love it. I love it. <laughs> hey, also shout out to us uh, and thank you to Business Insider for listing this podcast as one of the best podcasts for 2023. Yeah. So shout out to us. And like, shout out to y'all for listening. Yeah. yeah shout yeah. out to everybody. Let's just <laughs> shout out everybody. Yeah, let's do it. Well, no. <laughs> Not let's everybody. get into the actual <laughs> <Not> topic. <you. laughs> All right. So uh, right around this time, uh, what, last year, I think, last we year. actually did an episode called Demystifying Retirement. Uh, it's episode 55. And I remember recording it right after we recorded our audio book because we realized it was a conversation that people needed to have and they weren't having. Mm-hmm. So we highly suggest you go back and listen to that episode because it's a good primer, I think, for today's episode where we're mainly going to talk about the different retirement accounts, what you can do if you're a late bloomer and maybe might be behind on some of your contributions. And I think most importantly, because I don't hear enough about this, when to stop contributing. I feel mm-hmm. like so many people are just on autopilot. They pat themselves on the back, but like most people don't actually, as they should, begin with the end in mind. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about that. And of course, we're going to go through all of the alphabet soup of uh, accounts from 401ks and IRAs. Remind me, I had a great idea. Oh, gosh. Or maybe it wasn't a great idea. <laughs> And I didn't write it down, but I think it was like a T-shirt idea. I had like this note, and it's probably somewhere on my phone, where I, I had this idea for like a um, T-shirt. And basically, it was just like listing like a, what I call the alphabet soup. So 401k, Roth, 403, 4, all this weird stuff. <laughs> 457B. But it's like there's a short list of things, and this the those accounts are on there where it's like, yeah, I don't know what it means, but... No, it's like, I don't know what it stands for, but I know what it means. <laughs> like, there are very few things that sort of qualify for that. And I think this is one of those yeah. kinds of topics. Like, I don't know what any of that stuff stands for. But I know but what I, it means. I know what it does for me. I know what it does. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there are so many different types of retirement accounts. And that's because they're actually designed to cater to different needs and preferences of individuals. Yep. Now, you kind of alluded to this. One of the most common is the 401k. And we actually go into a deep dive on the history of the 401k in the episode that Julian just referenced, episode 55. But as most of you know, a 401k is a retirement plan that's offered by employers to their employees. The contributions to your 401k are deducted from your paycheck. So they're pre-tax, which we talked about in last week's episode, and the money in your 401k grows tax-free until you withdraw it. Now, other retirement accounts that work similar to the 401k are the 403b, which is a retirement plan that's offered by public schools, and certain 501c tax-exempt organizations, or a 457b, which is offered to government employees. So again, alphabet soup, but they all kind of do the same thing. They set aside pre-tax money that grows tax-free until it's time to 
withdraw it. Yeah, like your typical retirement age. I think it was, you know, should look that up. It changes every year too. It was what? like 65, I think, 65 and a half. It's gotten earlier. People okay, yeah, they've been moving earlier. it up. Yeah, there's been lots of little, little things that they do every single year uh, with these accounts. So. Yeah. So as great as a 401k is, there are some downsides to a 401k being your only retirement account. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest one is that there are limits to how much you can contribute. And the second one is that it's kind of tied to your employment. It's not like you can write a separate check to invest in your 401k. It has to come out of your paycheck. And so in that sense, it's conditional on consistent employment which used to not be a big deal. But in today's world, consistent employment is kind of rare. Yeah. Maybe not rare, but like at least medium well. <laughs> like it's not. It's, it's a very confusing food pun. Because <laughs> like, are you saying it's a good, a good thing? I'm just saying it's rare. But then I thought maybe no. it's not so rare. Just leave the, leave it's the, pink in the middle. Leave the food puns to me. Okay, I, I want to add to that list, though, um, before we move on. But I think one of the other things that I think is a bit of a downside to 401ks, which just for the record, by and large, we think they're great, right? Like, that's, yeah, that's we awesome. Them. We have them. Love them. But you also do not have or you're sort of restricted to the types of fund options that you have, right? So like if you are dead set on investing with a particular type of fund or a particular set of funds, they may or may not be available to you, right? Like your employer's plan just may not have that. And so you might feel like, oh man, like, you know, and it's so weird because it's one of those things that like don't really come up in the interview process, Mm -hmm. you know? And I've always wanted to ask that, you know, back in the day, but you just sort of accepted it. But it was like, oh, I can't wait to see what's available. But really- like these days, I would kind of want to know like what's available before I tie myself to this particular company. So anyway, uh, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about the other alphabet soup of retirement accounts, which is the IRA, which is an acronym for individual retirement accounts. So an IRA is a retirement account that you can open and contribute to on your own. So that in and of itself is what makes it very different from the accounts that Kirsten was just talking about. And there are two primary types of IRAs. So there's a traditional IRA, which is a good fit if you expect to be in a lower tax bracket in your retirement age, which is the case for the vast majority of people. Almost anyone can open one as long as you're receiving income and your contributions to those accounts are tax deductible. Again, we talked a little bit about tax deductions and how that works in a previous episode. Uh, But what that basically means is the amount that you contribute to your IRA can then be deducted from your gross income and therefore lowers the total amount that you're actually paying federal taxes on. So there are multiple benefits to investing uh, and choosing to contribute to a traditional IRA. Very similar to a 401k, uh, that money grows tax-free until you withdraw it. And so there are these sort of mandatory withdrawal dates, typically around that retirement age, like in your 60s and 70s. Sometimes I move them up, sometimes I move them back. But basically at some point, the IRS requires you to withdraw money from them, require distributions. Uh, And up until that point, the money sort of grows tax-free. So that's traditional IRAs. The other one uh, is where things get a little tricky for some folks, but this is also, I think, a lot of people's favorites accounts, uh, which is a Roth IRA. And it works similar to a traditional IRA with a couple of tweaks. So unlike a traditional IRA, you're not making contributions to a Roth using pre-tax dollars. You're using post tax dollars. And what this does is it ensures that your money grows tax-free basically forever, right? You're not going to be forced to pay taxes on it in the future because you sort of pay taxes on it before you made the actual contributions. Right. To pay taxes again. With the That's double dipping and the yeah. IRS is not going to do that. Unless for some reason something crazy happens. I don't see that happening. The decision that you're typically making here, and there's always talk about this, I guess it's like one of the primary conversations in the personal finance and investing world is which one is best. Should you invest in a traditional? Should you invest in a Roth? Again, it all goes down to whether or not you anticipate you'll be paying more or less taxes in the future. In theory, you want to minimize the amount that you're paying in taxes. And so you're making a guesstimate as to whether or not it's best to pay taxes now versus what you anticipate you might have to pay in the future. 
most people are, it's, it's practically impossible to make that sort of decision. No one can predict the future. So just make the best decision that you can. And of course, whenever you need help, you can reach out to a tax planner or a CPA. I want to add a couple of quick notes here. There are contribution limits to both of these accounts. And so in 2023, uh, the contribution limit, the max amount that you can contribute to either one of these was $6,500. The IRS does offer incentives, what they call catch-up contributions for older uh, investors. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, the second one, this is one of the other things that I think makes Roth IRAs just a little tricky for some folks, is that there are also income limitations. So traditional IRAs don't have an income limit, meaning it doesn't matter how much money you can make, you make, you can always contribute to a tra- traditional IRA. Roth IRAs are a little different. There are income limitations. Uh, This also changes every year, which is what I think adds to the confusion. But to contribute to a Roth, your modified adjusted gross income, which is different from just your adjusted gross income, you'll see that line item when you file your taxes. That number has to be less than $153,000. And this is the 2023 contribution, right? So something to think about. If you are eligible, go ahead and do it. It's always a great idea to save and invest. But if you're one of those fortunate people who don't, don't worry. And I'm sure you probably already know this. There are other types of accounts that you can use. The last thing that I'm going to mention very, very briefly is what's called a backdoor Roth IRA. And this is a tool, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but basically it's for people who have a traditional IRA, convert some of those funds or all of those funds into a Roth IRA. You're basically taking advantage of you can call it a loophole or basically a function of some of these accounts. But people do that, especially like in the early retirement and financial independence community. They do that basically so that they can access the money that's sort of housed in these tax deferred accounts earlier than the required withdrawal dates to minimize or in some cases eliminate paying taxes. Again, we're not going to get into all of that stuff here, but just wanted to make sure that is an option available for you because I know a lot of people ask those questions because they're trying to figure out, well, I'm doing these things, but how do I get my money without like having to pay the 10%, 20% in some cases, uh, penalties that come from withdrawing early from tax deferred accounts. So we've talked about these as employer-sponsored retirement accounts, but I think it's really important to note that there are also 401ks and IRA options for the self-employed folks that are out there. Mm -hmm. We meet a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners, and sometimes they're so stuck in the day-to-day that they forget that they have to plan for their own retirement. There's no employer that's doing that for them. Yeah, and they think that all their wealth is just in real estate or it's all in the business. they They don't think about it. It's almost as if they think it's something that employees do or even their employees do, but they forget to do it for themselves. Right. So if you have a small business or a sole proprietorship that doesn't have any employees other than a spouse, so that would be like our business where it's just the two of us, the solo 401k is a great option. It allows you to contribute as both the employee and the employer, which makes the contribution limits much higher. This is what we have. And just to put it in perspective, like Julian mentioned, the 401k contribution limit for 2023. Actually, I don't think you mentioned this. The 401k contribution limit for 2023. 2023 is $22,500, but the solo 401k contribution limit is up to $66,000. Yeah, that's the combination of both. Like once you right. add in both of them, you get that that uh, sort of premium on it. And I love to kind of call that out, not just because, you know, we're sort of pro entrepreneurship, but because I think one of the things that people use to discourage solo uh, 401ks is that, oh, well, you don't get a match. And it's like, well, you are, the, you are the match, yeah. right? So you can match it. Like you can match the entire amount. Like it's not 4% or 3% and it's not tiered down. Like you get, like you said, up to $66,000 that you can put into a solo 401k as an entrepreneur uh, that like goes straight in your pocket. So like it's, it's really, really awesome and a great tool. And I think in a huge incentive for people who are looking to save for retirement. And even if you have more than two people in your business, you and your spouse, if you're self-employed and the owner of a business that has limited employees, like under 100, you can also open a SEP IRA or a simple IRA that allows you to extend the retirement benefits to your teams. Yep. 
All right. So I think that's uh, about 60% of the alphabet soup. 401ks, we talked a little bit about traditional and Roth IRAs. I want to move on to a couple of other accounts. Uh, And primarily, I'm going to spend some time talking about HSAs and more recently, the 529 plan, which is like a college savings account. So an HSA, which is another acronym for health savings account, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that there is an investing component to this. It's not just like a function of your health insurance or something like that. It's far more complex uh, and useful, in my opinion, than that. Uh, HSAs were designed to incentivize Americans to save for health-related expenses because when you contribute to an HSA, you can basically deduct the contribution from your income taxes. So You can opt to invest a portion of that money, which grows tax-free until you use it for qualified medical expenses. And the reason it can also be considered a retirement account uh, and what makes it really cool is that once you turn 65, you can use that money in your HSA for any purpose without a penalty, which I think that's new. I don't know that that was always like that. Uh, Or maybe it was, and I just never really thought about it because I haven't quite envisioned life at past 65. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been, been there as long as I've known about HSAs. Okay, I just know there's been a lot of changes going on over the last couple of years. So, okay. Uh, so you'll still have to pay taxes on the withdrawals if you're not using them for qualified medical expenses. But other than that, it's basically a secret stash of money that can be used for any purpose in retirement, which I think is great. Most people I know who have HSAs love them. We have HSAs and love them. It's a great way, like uh, like I said, to sort of stash money if you're, uh, especially if you wanted to, let's say, uh, contribute to a Roth IRA, but you happen to just make a little bit more or too much uh, over the contribution uh, limitation or the income limitation. With the HSA, you actually don't have that problem. You can sort of use that to contribute as like a type of retirement account, if you will, instead of um, a Roth IRA. Uh, The contribution limits are a little different too, though. So in 2023, you're allowed to contribute up to $3,850 for self-only coverage and $7,750 for family coverage. The other uh, quick things that I'll call out here for HSAs is that people use it uh, as a tool to kind of supplement their insurance and therefore lower their insurance premium costs. So the way that I think about it is you're either going to pay a high premium throughout your working career and your life uh, for health insurance to cover the possibility that something happened, or you can choose to pay less to that insurance company by way of premiums. Uh, Use that money instead to go towards an HSA. And in a way, you're kind of building your own pool of money that you can use to pay for medical costs uh, as opposed to always leaning on an insurance company to do it. And again, this is not an either or kind of thing. Most people sort of do a little bit of both, but it's really cool because if you don't happen to use your pot of money, you get to keep your pot of money instead of giving your money in the form of premiums to an insurance company, nothing happening and you really not getting anything in return other than the comfort in knowing that nothing happened. And there's no limitation on the reimbursement from an HSA. So in theory, if you are paying your medical costs out of pocket along the way, when you turn 65, you can take the same receipts from when you were 32 or 38 or 42 and use them to withdraw and reimburse yourself from that account to keep the money tax free, even in withdrawal. Yeah. Okay, similar to the HSA, there is the 529, and we also did an episode on 529s way back when. It's episode 15, back when we were baby podcasters, and they have continued to evolve since we recorded that episode. It's still a really good listen for a primer, but I'll give you a quick description of what a 529 is and why it can be considered a retirement account due to some recent legislative changes. Very exciting. Like an HSA, a 529 is a tax advantage investment plan for qualified educational expenses and contributions to your 529 plan grow tax free from federal taxes. Now, before recently, if you didn't use your 529, let's say because your kid decided to skip college or maybe they got scholarships or they didn't have any early education expenses. Or they just wanted to start their rap career. Whatever it is, you would basically have to pay a penalty to withdraw the money for a reason outside of education or change the beneficiary so someone else could use it or use it for yourself or continued education. But buried deep in the recent $1.7 trillion spending bill that passed last year was a section that amends the tax code so beneficiaries of 529 plans can roll up to $5,000 
$35,000 of their funds from their 529 to a Roth IRA penalty free starting in 2024. Yeah. Now, of course, there are some restrictions and caveats. The rollovers can only begin once the money has been in a 529 plan for 15 years and the amount is still subject to Roth IRA limits. But again, it's another incentive for people to set aside money in advance. All right. So uh, going back to what you were saying about 529s, I think the other reason why I like that that function or that change that they uh, passed uh, last year uh, is because it just removes another obstacle for people, right? I think there's so much talk about whether or not college degrees are even worth it or whether or not colleges are going to be affordable in the future, uh, which I think in some ways has discouraged a lot of people from even investing in a 529 plan. So by them adding this additional layer of flexibility, I think it kind of removes at least some of the hesitation that some folks may have and to say, all right, well, it's not like all is lost. There's more that you can do with that money or you can repurpose those funds uh, into to other types of accounts. Uh, but while we're talking about incentives, I want to talk about um, two other kind of categories, uh, two incentives. And so the first one is what are called catch-up contributions. Uh, and like you mentioned earlier, for 2023, there's a limit to how much you can invest or contribute to a 401k account. This year, the number is $22,500, which by the way, sounds absolutely crazy to me. Like I, I've been investing long enough to the point where I remember when that was like around eleven thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I feel like that was over twenty years ago. And yeah, the I, limit keeps increasing. Yeah, it does. It, it does every year, and and they 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 have the option to do that. I know there were some years where they didn't do that, and but more recently, like they, I feel like they've been getting a bit more aggressive. But I remember when it was eleven thousand, fourteen thousand. Like so, to know that you can now contribute up to twenty two thousand five hundred dollars, like tax free. Every single year, it first of all, is amazing. Secondly, further proves the point that we made in our book around the 15-year career. If you can do that for 10 years, especially 15 years, in addition to like practically anything else to earn more money and you just put that into, let's say, a Roth or something else, you're in a very different financial situation than most people who aren't able to do that. And if you can do that with a partner, we're talking about a lot of money. Like you start to see how quite honestly, easy it is to become a millionaire in 15 years. So that's one of the several reasons why I really, really like this stuff. But what's also interesting is now that I'm in my 40s, which is why I feel like there's an entire component to personal finance that is now starting to make a little bit more sense or at least be more interesting to me because I'm closer to these catch-up periods than I was when I first started learning about money. So basically, as a way for the government to incentivize people who are older to contribute more in the event they haven't been able to contribute in the past, or just as an incent- added incentive to contribute more because you're eligible, they add in all of these little sort of uh, additional cushions that allow you to basically stash even more than what people who are under that age limit are. And so for IRAs, uh, it's $7,500 if you're over 50. For HSAs, it's an additional $1,000 if you're over 55. Uh, 529s don't really have that. Taxable brokerage accounts don't have that because there basically aren't really very many uh, limitations like income limitations or contribution limits to them. You can invest as much as you want. In and for 401ks, it's $7,500 as well. Yeah. An additional $7,500 that you can add to it, which sounds amazing, right? <laughs> so shout out to all of the people who actually take full advantage of that. And again, whether you're catching up or not, it's not like the government is going to say you don't need to catch up. Like if you just choose because you got a raise and you don't really have any other purpose for that income, then you can very much say, you know what, while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and stash another 7500 in my 401k, tax-free, and call it a day. Uh, fun fact, or maybe it's an unfun fact, according to Investopedia.com, 98% of 401ks allow you to make these catch-up contributions, but only 16% of people actually take advantage of them. Not shaming. I totally understand that there are uh, tons of reasons as to why people might not be able to do that, but it's something to be mindful of. It's not something that a lot of people do. Uh, And so, you know, just something to be uh, mindful of. Don't be that person if you have an opportunity to do it. Uh, Okay, so that's one type of incentive, these idea of catch-up contributions. But there's also one that um, is really, really cool, and it's basically a prior year contribution. This is basically, I keep saying loophole. I got to find another way. Uh, to call it, because I don't want to make a scene. It's an incentive. (laughs) It's not a loophole, but, you know, 
people will make you think like it's always oh, this little trick that I'm Yeah, doing. they call it a loophole because it's a way to pay less taxes, but it's an incentive because you're actually investing the money. You're saving the government money right. <laughs> by preparing for your own future. Right. So like it's not a loophole that they're not that they don't want you to use. Yeah, I just I think it's it's just so often used as like a tax attacked that people can use to like sort of get over on the system. And I don't want to insinuate that yeah, at all. No, it's the system it's something that every <laughs> single one of us has an opportunity to do. But yeah, so it's an incentive. Prior year contributions. This is basically uh, when the IRS allows you to, uh, prior to filing your taxes for the current year, they say, hey, you sure you don't want to contribute to any one of these retirement accounts for the prior year? And what's cool is the way I think about it is you kind of have like 16 months to contribute to this 12 month period. Right. So you, up until the tax filing day, which is like typically mid April, up until that day and we're in 2023 right now, you have the ability to say, hey, I've got some extra money and I actually don't want it to go towards any of my retirement accounts for the year of 2023. I want to put that towards 2022, which one benefits you. Obviously, you can't go back in time and compound interest, but you can go back in time and adjust your uh, adjusted gross income, which can lower your prior year tax bill. So really, really cool. Obviously, these things can get uh, a little confusing. But in my experience, when you're actually making these contributions, it's as simple as checking a box. So it's like, I'm going to invest this money. How much? And it's like, do you want to do it for this year or next year? Check the box, easy peasy, and you're done. Yeah. And so this leads us to the million dollar question, which is when should you stop contributing to retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who have saved consistently for retirement kind of have trouble making this transition from saver to spender or just letting the money sit there and and compound on its own when it's actually time because the habit is so strong. And technically, you can still make catch-up contributions to non-employer-sponsored retirement accounts even after you leave your job as long as you have taxable income. So for all of the retired people who have jobs or side hustles or hobbies that earn them income, they can still be contributing to their non-employer sponsored retirement accounts. So the answer to this question, when should you stop, is like 98% of the other questions that get asked on this podcast. And that's, it depends. There's a lot of things that you want to factor in. But one of the first things that you want to factor in is longevity risk. And we'll talk about this a little more on an upcoming podcast when we talk about life insurance. But the reality is most people don't prepare for the possibility that they're going to live a really long time. They undersave, they don't arrange their own care. And instead of worrying about dying, they actually worry about living. (laughs) They're looking at the pile of money. They're looking at their health and the trajectory. And they know one of these things is not like the other. According to a 2017 survey by the Society of Actuaries, one out of three men and one out of two women who are currently in their 50s will live to be 90. And there's a 50 percent chance that at least one partner in the couple will still be alive at 92. Yeah. So longevity risk doesn't just affect how long your retirement savings will last, but also how you should calculate your monthly withdrawals. Now, the tricky part is that it's really hard to calculate, especially during a worldwide health crisis. But the good news is that there is more data in research than ever before about the factors that affect your longevity. Everything from your genetics, your neighborhood, your personal habits, education levels, access to medical care and knowledge, your social connections, all of this impacts (laughs) marriage. All of this impacts how long we live. So like I said, on an upcoming podcast, we will talk about how you can transfer some of that risk through financial tools like life insurance and annuities. But step one is really to take stock and set a somewhat arbitrary yet informed goal for your retirement savings, whether it's living comfortably for 30 more years and dying with zero like the book suggests, or if you want to have a little something left over to leave to your kids or a charity or something that matters to you. But calculating and then hitting that goal in your portfolio is a really good first milestone that indicates that it might be okay to stop saving for retirement. Arbitrary yet informed. Arbitrary yet informed. (laughs) That's better than what you said, a guesstimate. A guesstimate. Yeah, but it's arbitrary. But uh, But it's informed. Well informed. (laughs) Now, I'm glad you brought this up because culturally, you know, we pride ourselves on getting the best health care plans, but we don't 
necessarily think of that healthcare as a mechanism for extending life, which creates a greater need for a retirement plan. Right. And it also goes to show how intermingled, I think, retirement plan and estate planning are. Like even something like medical directives, which you can put in a will or a trust, affect longevity, which changes the denominator on your retirement calculator. And this is the point in the podcast. I really just want to encourage you to take advantage of some of the tools and resources that are available to start to play out different scenarios to kind of get your brain warmed up for what's ahead. So retirement calculators, which will give you a general North Star. But if you're really into the analytics of it all, you can look for a Monte Carlo simulation, which kind of brings me back to grad school. (laughs) But the Monte Carlo simulation is basically a mathematical technique that predicts possible outcomes of uncertain events. They used to explain the impact of risk and uncertainty and forecasting models. And so it's really good to kind of say, well, this is what's happening (laughs) Can you give me, I'm, I'm going to go back to guesstimate because I think more people uh, are familiar <laughs> I was about to go to crystal ball. As Can soon as you, you said mathematical technique to predict I mean, possible outcomes of an uncertain event. That's what it like, is. Wow. That's what it is. <laughs> that is straight from Google. It is. Uh, but that's a very fancy way of saying it's a crystal ball. It's an AI it's tarot card. It's a fortune card. cookie. <laughs> it's an it's a artificially <laughs> intelligent tarot card, basically. <laughs> but they are there. And, they, you know, again, this is really just about helping people kind of make sense and feel, I think, a little bit more comfortable with the estimates or the estimations that they're making. Karsten at Early Retirement Now is a good resource for those. If you need more hands-on guidance, it might be worth just investing or meeting with a fiduciary fee-only advisor just to kind of help them say, well, this is what I see, this is what I think, this is what your situation is. And I think that added layer of support, I think, might help you um, make a better decision. All right. So we've talked about longevity risk. We've talked about creating a goal for your retirement account and hitting that goal. We've talked about using different calculators, sitting down with a fiduciary fee only financial advisor. Another sign that it might be okay to stop contributing is when you're debt free and the combination of Social Security withdrawals from your retirement accounts and any other income that you may be counting on will actually cover your expenses plus inflation. Yep. So this is a more of a cash flow type argument where it's not about the total size of your portfolio. It's about the combination of income that you'll have and whether you think that'll be enough to cover your basic needs. And then another indicator that it may be time to stop contributing is when you've hit the RMD or the required minimum distributions. So like Julian mentioned earlier, the IRS actually requires you to start cashing out a portion of your retirement savings every year once you turn 73, or you'll have to pay tax penalties. So if you've hit that required distribution age, that might be a sign that you can stop investing and start drawing down more often. Yep. All right. So these last two are for the folks among us who I think are a little bit more comfortable with risk. You might decide that it's time to stop investing in your 401k because you've spent a really long time investing in it and you're just comfortable with the understanding of compounding interest. You're very clear on what your uh, fund options are, the history of those funds, and you've got a pretty good idea of what that amount is going to be predictably at some point in the future. There's a reason why there are some of these sub layers to the financial independence movement. One of the more popular ones is Coast Fire, the idea that you're comfortable letting the big pot of money sort of coast over the next couple of years. It might be a couple of decades. For some people, it might be even longer because you're very clear that what you have is going to be enough and in some cases more than enough. So the last indicator uh, that might be something you think uh, or factor into whether or not you do not need to contribute more to your 401k or your retirement accounts is if you found other, let's say, better investment opportunities that provide like a higher rate of return than your retirement accounts are doing in that moment or that they may have in perpetuity. This could be that you stumbled upon an epic business idea. You created a little cash flow engine that's sort of kicking off some supplemental income for you. It could be that you've gotten into real estate and now you can sort of live a little bit or withdraw some of the funds from the rent that you're collecting or 
properties that you're flipping or any of these other number of things. Basically, you've entered into a world where you're just a little bit more comfortable with risk. You have a wide variety of income sources. You may have stumbled into an inheritance. You know, all of these little things sort of combined might make you say, you know what, I, I don't need to contribute to stash more money into an account that might be difficult to get money out of, right? I can withdraw that money. I can spend some of that money. I can give some more of that money away. Uh, so these are just things that uh, you might want to think about. And if you're lucky, then um, congratulations. That's a good problem to have. Right. <laughs> All right. We know this episode was chock full and loaded, so we'll move to final thoughts. And I'm actually going to borrow my final thought from the last time we talked about this. But one of the biggest misperceptions is that retirement is this team sport, and it's simply not. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be. I'm just saying that's not what it is. And during this episode, we've laid out several incentives that the government gives you to pre-fund your retirement while you're still working and in your working years. And my theory, this is my theory, not an official theory, but my theory is that the reason they do this is so that when they don't provide you enough at the time that you need it, they can say, hey man, I gave you every unfair advantage before this, so it's not really on me to help you figure out a solution, which again, I'm not saying that's right, but I am saying that's the system we're operating in. So Take that and do what you will with it. I sadly agree. All right. My final thoughts. I think, you know, part of what makes retirement accounts so personal is that everyone's situation is different. Your income, your future expenses, your health condition, the size of your family. And and I I say that because I, I think there are so many of us who are so like sharply convicted about the way that they believe money should flow and be structured. And like, just because one person in your life isn't investing in their 401k, or you may have a friend who has a 529, but you don't, like none of these, this is not about right or wrong. Right. This is not about, hey, these are all of the things that you can take advantage of and therefore you should. Some of these things just may not make sense for you. And obviously obvious things like a 529 uh, may not make sense for you if you don't have a child. But you might say, well, I plan on having children. Or you might say, you know what, I'm going to be the rich auntie or uncle. I'm going to open up this account for my nieces and nephews, right? Like all of these things are personal decisions. So they're there for a different variety of reasons. They are mechanisms that the IRS uh, puts in place to allow you to make the most of the income that you generate. And obviously, if you do any one of these or any combination of these over time, you end up in a better situation than you would be if you didn't. And so uh, we just wanted to make sure that we ran through some of these things and make sure that we were updating you all, refreshing you all in the event that you knew some of this stuff. And um, listen, I'll see you guys in 10 to 15 years. Hopefully we're all rich and sexy and on a, on a cruise somewhere <laughs> talking about our fat 401k retirement balances. Oh, well, thank you for listening to another episode of the Rich and Regular podcast presented by Success. I thought I was going to have a different incentive. Get it? a different incentive for you to leave a five-star review, but I think Julian just took care of that. So if you like what you heard, please leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Ratings and Review page, and we'll see you on the cruise. 2043. (laughs) See you guys on Royal Caribbean. (laughs) We'll see you next week.